welcome. And thank you all so far for joining. Um, my name is Chantal Freeman and I am the Senior Assistant Director for the Office of Online Engagement and I will be one of your facilitators this evening. Um, so joining me this evening is my colleague Becca Lazinsk, who is the Assistant Director of Alumni Engagement. And we're both honored to be here with you all for this Global Days of Service community panel focusing on shelter. So before we have the pleasure of introducing you to tonight's guests, um, tonight we will go ahead and just review a few housekeeping items um, for participants here. So um, you'll notice that your microphone and video have been removed and that's just to reduce any background noise. Uh, at the bottom of your screen, you should see a Q&A pod, and that will be present throughout the presentation. So if you have any questions, feel free to pop them in there. We'll definitely um, plan to carve out some time at the end of this evening's panel to get to a few of your questions and thoughts. Uh, tonight's panel, including the Q&A, are currently being recorded. So there's no obligation to type or ask questions in uh, the session for participation. And just know, due to the nature of the topic for this evening, um, please be advised there may be sensitive situations and content that could be discussed. So we'll also note that Becca and I are not the experts in the field and all of our panelists have varying experiences tonight. So tonight's session is really intended to be an inclusive learning experience for everyone. So we're excited to get learning with you all. And please keep an eye out um, at the end of our session for a feedback survey, which we would just appreciate if you were able to take some time and do and let us know your thoughts on tonight's session. So I would now like to take a minute just to share the online accessibility statement with you all to serve as a reminder for resources available to our students. So your experience here at Southern New Hampshire University is important to us. It is our policy and practice to create an inclusive and accessible learning environment. If there are aspects of this event that present barriers to accessibility, please notify the Online Accessibility Center at oac at snhu.edu or by phone at 866 305-9430 or the Campus Accessibility Center at cac at snhu.edu or by phone at 603-644-3118 as soon as possible. And please provide at least one week advance notice to co coordinate any event accommodations. So at this time, I'd like to turn it over to Becca to tell you a little bit about Global Days of Service, which is how you all found us this evening. Becca, go ahead and take it away. Thank you. Thank you all for joining us for this part of Global Days of Service. Uh, many of you, some of you might be familiar with the traditional uh, in-person Global Days of Service that has happened in years past. And since we're not able to gather in person this year, uh, we pivoted. Uh, the Office of Alumni Engagement at Destiny 2 decided to uh, make this a multi-month event so we could focus on a different service movement from February through May. You're joining us right on time in March with each month taking a closer look at a specific social issue. Our goal is to strengthen communities across the globe and bring students, alumni, faculty, and staff together to help. We're offering educational sessions, DIY project ideas, community resources, and spotlights of different SNHU community members. Um, we'll share a link at the end so you can take a look at what else you can get involved in this month and what's ahead for April um, and May will be posted soon. Pass it back to you, Chantel. Perfect, thank you so much. So as Becca mentioned, um, each month we've been focusing on a specific service topic and so March, and as you all know, as, as you're here, um, Mar March's focus for the uh, service education is on homelessness and thinking about shelter. So while getting an accurate picture of homelessness is extremely challenging just due to varying definitions. Here's just a quick glance um, at the statistics for shelter and um, homelessness. So uh, you can see here at least 500,000 people are currently experiencing homelessness on a single night and that is pre-COVID number. So you can imagine that the challenges that the pandemic has come about um, has probably increased that number. So 30% of the entire homeless population is made up of families with children. Um, over 40 million uh, Americans are living in poverty, which, which can put them at risk of experiencing homelessness. And over 1.8 billion people lack adequate housing worldwide. So as you can see, homelessness impacts communities throughout the country and the world. So we're so fortunate to have four panelists with us this evening throughout the SNU community who will share with us their connections with homelessness work and talk about their experiences with the realm and also provide ideas on how we can all get involved ourselves. 
So in terms of the structure for this evening, just so you know what to expect, Becca and I will be facilitating questions to our panelists, interview style. So panelists, we'll make sure to call on you so that you'll all know which one um, of you that we'd like to answer first, but you'll all have an opportunity to answer the question. So as a reminder, as we're hearing from panelists, if you have questions, feel free to pop them into that Q&A pod at the bottom there um, and share reflections as well. Um, as I mentioned, we'll aim to have some time later this evening to address questions as they arise. Um, but if we run out of time, we will share contact information for all of our panelists at the conclusion of the event. So um, if we aren't able to get to your questions, please know you'll have those available to you. So we now have the pleasure of introducing you to our speaker this, speakers this evening. There are four. So your first panelist this evening is Whitney Mooney. So Whitney is a two-time graduate of Southern New Hampshire University with a BA in communications and an MS in political science. She is currently the development and marketing manager at the w uh, YWCA Cambridge Mass, an organization on a mission to eliminate racism and empower women. Whitney is also a member of the Wallingford Democratic Town Committee as their diversity coordinator. In her free time, she reads and continues her research on prison reform and racial justice. And I'll kick it over to Becca. Awesome. I'm excited to introduce Maria Devlin. Maria Devlin is the President and Chief Executive Officer for the Families in Transition. As such, she has the overall strategic and operating responsibility for staff, planning, development, management, and successful implementation of programs and services, community engagement, and the execution of strategic objectives and mission of the organization. Prior to her arrival in June of 2020, Maria was the Regional Chief Executive Officer for the American Red Cross of Northern New England, where she served for over 12 years. Maria is a motivated, community-oriented professional with a proven record of building solid relationships, developing and executing financial strategies, working with management at all levels, and successful program design and delivery. Maria holds two master's degrees, including one in organizational leadership from Southern New Hampshire University. She is a New Hampshire native, lives in Merrimack with her husband, Jamie, one parakeet, and a mini pig named Ruby. She has a daughter, Abby, and a stepdaughter, Lorelai. And next up, we have Matt Sharp. So Matt Sharp is a Chief Operating Officer of Runnyworks, a grassroots nonprofit in Charlotte, North Carolina, providing case management and outreach services to promote healthy lifestyle habits for children and adults experiencing homelessness and poverty. Matt joined the Running Works team in July of 2017 after 13 years in the, the field of higher education, specifically in the area of student involvement, event planning, and leadership development. Matt graduated from Southern New Hampshire University in 2004 with his bachelor's in hotel resort management. He then served as a graduate assistant for SNHU's Office of Student Involvement and received his master's of business administration in 2006 from SNHU. And i uh, also going to introduce tonight Doug Howard. Doug Howard is the Housing Stability Program Manager at the Front Door Agency in Nashua, New Hampshire. After earning his bachelor's and master's at Southern New Hampshire University, he worked at several community nonprofits and school districts in New Hampshire, including Second Start in Concord, Waypoint in Manchester, Southern New Hampshire Services in Manchester, Harbor Care in Nashua, the Nashua School District, My Turn Inc. in Nashua, and the Granite United Way in Manchester. Through the various roles at these agencies and school districts, Doug primarily worked with single individuals, families, and unaccompanied youth experiencing homelessness. He has had the honor of working with some of New Hampshire's most dedicated social service workers, educators, and public service officials, and he's very grateful for the time they spent mentoring him on his journey. Now with the Front Door Agency, he uses his, his experience with those in the greater Nashua community who are, on, who are on the fringe of experiencing homelessness, along with those who are currently experiencing literal homelessness. Through coordinating with partner agencies and local landlords, he works to help secure housing for the community's most vulnerable populations. Doug lives in Hudson, New Hampshire with his wife, Nicole, who is currently working on her MBA at SNU and their dog, Benson, which might make an appearance, I hear. Awesome. Thank you so much uh, for all of you for being here tonight. Um, I think we can kick it off with the questions to start. So first, um, I'd love for each of you to tell us about yourself and your work. What organizations are you involved with? How long have you been involved? And anything else we should know about you? Um, Whitney, I'll start with you. Hi, everyone. Um, 
My name is Whitney Mooney. I am the Development and Marketing Manager at YWCA Cambridge in Massachusetts. Um, um, one of the small benefits of COVID-19 has given me the opportunity to work remote from that uh, for them from Connecticut, which is really great because I've been able to um, you know, help on the ground here in um, Wallingford, Connecticut. Um, but my work at uh, Walling, or sorry, <laughs> at YWCA Cambridge, um, I've been there for three and a half years. Um, I've served in different capacity spaces as the administrative assistant, the fund development manager, and now the development and marketing manager, where I really focus my energy on um, fundraising and marketing um, the work that we do so that we can bring in more donors. Thank you. Uh, Maria, do you want to go next? Sure. Hi. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for having me here tonight. Um, it's nice to be in a room with so many people who are trying to help those who are experiencing some uh, different levels of homelessness and poverty in our communities. Um, I have had the pleasure of being in New Hampshire in nonprofit organizations my entire career, so over 30 years of experience, everything between um, child abuse and neglect prevention to working with adults with severe mental health issues to working with folks with substance abuse issues, um, youth who were not able to be at their home. So a little bit of everything. And uh, I actually uh, spent some time at SNHU and Matt, I actually think you were there when I worked at SNHU. So it's, it's good uh, to see people. Um, I, um, I have just started my role at Families in Transition uh, in June. So during the pandemic is when I made a very large uh, job shift for myself. And so I am learning a lot more about um, the housing first model, what it takes to house people who are homeless. Um, I've always been around homelessness, but we are certainly now in a position to help people uh, with families in transition. We, we work to house as many people as we can. So I'm excited to be here and share uh, my experiences. Thank you. Matt, can I toss it to you next? Absolutely. So again, yeah, thank you for having me on the panel tonight. Uh, similar to Maria, th there's a lot that I'm learning too. Uh, nonprofit world was not my first career. Uh, you know, being at uh, an institution down here in Charlotte for 11, 11 years uh, needed a change. And so uh, backing up, I'm, I'm from Vermont. I, I was on campus at SNHU for both my degrees and then came down here in 06 uh, to Charlotte. And so it was at the institution down here and uh, needed a change. About 2017, really needed a change. Moved into the nonprofit world uh, at Running Works. And so as kind of was mentioned, you know, we focus on those men and women experiencing homelessness through case management and outreach services, really focusing on five goals, wellness, uh, transportation, food insecurity, housing, and financial stability. Those areas that really sometimes are on um, untarget with uh, the men and women we serve. Um, and so love doing it. Uh, our, our focus, our goal, um, or our theme, I should say, is running. It's different from a lot of nonprofits. We use sport for social change, uh, kind of hook people in, uh, help them with their social health through races. We do about 25, 30 races a year that we're at as volunteers. So our team members, our clients, uh, they get to run the races, but then they also get to volunteer. They get to give back and they get to have uh, their social health uh, enlightened by being in the community. So uh, I've been doing it for four years now, love the work I do, I wouldn't, uh, wouldn't have it any other way. So again, thank you for having me tonight and I'm looking forward to the panel. Thank you. Doug, gonna shove this question for us. Sure, uh, my name is Doug Howard. Um, I'm the Housing Stability Program Manager at the Front Door Agency in Nashville, New Hampshire. Um, I've been a bit of a journeyman in terms of my work in nonprofit over the past 10 years or so, um, but um, I'm, ex I'm extremely grateful for that um, and uh, the opportunity to meet so many different people and to learn about so many different programs and different communities in and around New Hampshire. Um, so what we do at the front door is we have a, a number of different programs that range from a transitional living program for single mothers with young children. Uh, to my program with the Housing Stability, uh, which is comprised of three separate um, types of programs. So one is a security deposit loan program. So for instance, if let's say uh, 
me, my wife, my three children, I don't have three children, um, but, but if let's say, you know, there's a, there's a family that needs a bit of a bigger space, but you know, money's tight and, uh, you know, coming up with rent plus security deposit might be a bit of a stretch. That family can come to us and we can assist them in providing um, a, a loan to them so that they can pay that off slowly over time with a guarantee to the landlord that if something you know happens for whatever reason, we have that money and the landlord isn't going to be out you know, the security deposit. So we have that. Um, we also have rapid rehousing funds for individuals who are currently experiencing homelessness in shelter. Um, so we're actively working with landlords in our communities to work uh, to get people rehoused, and that's uh, and we we definitely use the housing first model, um, and uh, it's something that we really believe in, making sure that everyone has equal access to housing regardless of what their current situation is. And uh, lastly, the third pot of funds that we have is for prevention services, and that's really to keep people housed. Um, you know, especially during the pandemic, we we saw a number. Um, of individuals who never have asked for anything in their lives, you know, come forward and say, like, I need help. So it's uh, really been a humbling experience to, you know, be able to give back to a community that's given me so much. Thank you. Um, it's incredible to hear all the work that each of you are doing. It makes me really proud to be a part of the SNHU community. Um, and I'm excited to learn more about the work that you're doing. and. I think we're going to also transition into how people can get involved. So I'm going to hand it over to Chantel for the next question. Great. Yes, it's wonderful to hear, you know, in your respective areas, how you're you're working to to really serve these, you know, populations that really need it. And I think that, you know, when I think about the work that you do, and I know I'll, many of you mentioned that this wasn't necessarily your first choice and or sort of your first go at your career, right? So sort of changing careers and changing direction, or um, maybe just not what you initially had set out to do. So I would love to hear just like if you're thinking back and reflecting what the inspiration it was for you to, to jump into this work, because it's, it's heavy work and it's, it's hard work and, and it's not for the faint of heart, as I know you all, you know, probably know, but I would love to hear a little bit about, you know, what inspired you to first take the leap into this, into this space. So, um, Maria, would you like to kick that off? It's a loaded question. Um, <laughs> so I'll, I'll try and start. Um, so, you know, like I said, I've been a nonprofit um, professional my entire career. Um, I think I've always been somebody who have, has wanted to help people, right? Make the world a better place and, and help people. When the opportunity came to me to um, work at Families in Transition, I really had to think about what in that work really resonated with me, other than the fact that I knew I was going to help people and lead a wonderful organization organization that has a, a deep history in Manchester, specifically in New Hampshire. Um, and, you know, to be completely honest with everyone here, you know, my family struggled with food insecurity when I was growing up. We were very poor. We were a family of four children. My father worked three jobs. Um, we had cereal with powdered milk. We had government block cheese. Um, we grew up poor. I was lucky enough to have a a roof over my head. Um, but over the course of my years of living, um, members of my family have not been so lucky. So my brother has been homeless. My mother was actually homeless for a time. Um, and when you have family members who have been touched with by either mental health issues or substance use dis disorders, um, you know, just the lack of opportunity or um, the ability to get a good job to pay for a good place to live, um, that's going to affect your family. So for me, it's been very, it's a very personal journey. Um, the people that we serve every day are our brothers, mothers, others, cousins. I mean, they're, they're all our family. And we need to think about the fact that they did not ask um, to be in this position and they deserve the respect that each one of us deserves um, to live the life that they choose to live. So powerful. Thank you so much for sharing that. And yeah, you know, in terms of the personal connection that that definitely, you know, that you see that firsthand that everybody does deserve the respect and, and deserve the chance. So thank you so much for sharing that. Um, Matt, would you like to, to take it next? Sure. So uh, 
my foray into nonprofit world is a little bit different and in, into what I'm doing. Um, so what, what got me involved? Soccer, to be honest. Uh, so again, I've been down in Charlotte since 2006. And in 2009, uh, I always had played soccer, loved soccer. Uh, but in 2009, uh, through my church, we started a soccer team and we wanted to do good in the community. Well, there was a program here in Charlotte that actually started in Charlotte, North Carolina, and now is in several cities across the country called Street Soccer. So Street Soccer, uh, basically, it's very similar to Running Works. It uses soccer for social change. And so since 2009, 2010, we started volunteering. I started volunteering with my friends, playing soccer on a regular basis, playing in leagues, and getting to know the, the players who were homeless. Uh, you know, in high school, I might have done some soup kitchens, done work at a soup kitchen, or I might have done care packages, you know, worked in more uh, transactional interactions with uh, men and women who are experiencing homelessness. But it wasn't until playing soccer that I really got to build a relationship. And, and through those relationships, the humanity came through, seeing people for who they are and the similarities that we have. But by one decision or a choice or um, something out of someone's control, spiral down and, and they're in the position that they're in. And so fast forward until 2017, uh, my buddy who runs the street soccer program knew that my founder of Running Works was needing someone, made the connection, and here we are. Uh, and it just so happened that the skill set that I had was needed at the time at Running Works. And so it was a natural fit. A lot of the players who played in, in street soccer also ran at Running Works. And so I already had some, some inside credibility of, of the players and the, the team members I already knew. And so um, you know, working on a daily basis with these men and women who just need support, need community. Um, and that's how we stand out too. We're a family, we're a team, just like many sports teams or, or uh, a band or, you know, whatever you might have participated in. And so um, that has been my connection and, and still remains the, the passion that I have. That's so cool. And like you said, it, it really does, you know, you look at the statistics and you, and you see these numbers and, and you think about just the, the sheer number of, of people that are impacted by, you know, by shelter needs and, and homelessness. And, and then you, 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 you're running alongside them, right? And you're, and you're learning who they are. So that's, that's incredible. Um, so thank you for sharing that. Um, Doug, would you like to, to answer that question too? Yeah, sure. I mean, my, my journey into the nonprofit world um, was a little, was a little fun too. I mean, I, I had this, you know, vision that I was going to be an English teacher. Uh, that was my goal coming out of coming out of college. So my, my background is in, is in education. So I have the MED, but um, you know, I, I was working for the Concord School District after I finished my master's, and I felt I felt like I just wanted to stay in New Hampshire. I'm originally from Philadelphia, um, but before I came back to New Hampshire for my master's, I was working at a nonprofit um, there, working at a GED facility, working at a GED program. So I was, you know, helping adults who were all older than me. I was 21 at the time, and I called everyone Mr. and Mrs. They just called me Doug. I just thought it was the right thing to do. Um, but I remember one of my uh, one of my clients uh, wrote me a piece. Uh, we were, I did a writing prompt telling me a little bit about you know your background. He wrote about uh, his experience, um, his homeless experience, and uh, it's something that really stuck with me um, in terms of kind of like why I decided um, during the summer after my first year at Second Start, the alternative high school in Concord, to you know start looking at different opportunities in the community and. I found my way over to uh, what was Child Gang Services, and now is Waypoint. Um, and I had an opportunity to work at the Teen Resource Center there in Manchester under this lady named Erin Kelly, who's a fantastic woman. And, uh, I'm sure we'll be getting into some new homelessness topics a little bit later on, so that'll be that'll be fun to talk to you guys about. I'm really still very passionate about that, but that was really my my end, and I was able to kind of utilize my background in education to help the young people that we were working with and eventually that led into an opportunity with the national school district and i was their homeless school liaison for a number of years so my 
partnership with the Manchester School District and uh, this lady named Jocelyn Pinsonell, who is their liaison, who I love and adore, and I can't thank enough for, for her mentorship. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, been, it's been quite the journey for me, but, you know, right now I'm glad to, you know, be at, a, be at an organization where, you know, I'm, I'm, near to my, I'm near my home now, my adopted home in the greater Nashua area. And uh, I'm, again, able to utilize the connections that I have around the state to really affect change. So That's so, that's amazing. Like you said, now it's sort of come full circle, right? You, you, you've been an educator and sort of that's where your connections is. And then now you're here with us tonight and you're also educating and, and you do that every day in terms of your work. So it's, it's so, you know, you mentioned that you had the opportunity to be able to, to educate, but also they had the opportunity to be with you too. So it's just, it's a very cool way of, uh, you know, the connection that's made there. So thank you for sharing that. And Whitney, not last but not least, what, what was your inspiration? Oh gosh, I could go on for, uh, for a million years. Um, I would say all of my passion for um, working in homelessness has come from Southern New Hampshire University. Um, I worked for the Center for Community Engaged Learning, which is now the, Sham uh, the Chandler Sh Center. Center. Um, and I learned a lot about homelessness. I learned about the issues that it was affecting. I, I grew up um, in low income, uh, in a low income family where home, uh, homelessness was always like on the brink of an issue. Um, one, one, one bad bill was, was the next step for us. And so I think coming to SNU and learning more about homelessness and uh, growing up as a kid, you don't really know the issues. You don't know the issues your family's facing. And so I think for me, it was going to SNU and really um, working at the center and going to different sites, going to different um, service projects that got me into this, the world of nonprofit and that type of service. And I went from there to National Braille Press um, post-college. And um, I spent two and a half years there. Um, and that was an organization that focused on um, disability awareness and um, particularly Braille. And after spending two and a half years there, I got the opportunity to work for the YWCA at Cambridge and their mission is eliminating racism and empowering women. But what makes this per particular YWCA so um, unique is that we are one of the largest and oldest providers of housing um, for women in the Cambridge and greater Boston area. Um, we serve 103 single women in our single room occupancy, which is really similar to like Newcastle or Washington um, Hall at SNHU. Um, you share a, um, a bathroom. Um, it's a little different there. They share a kitchen as well, but they all have like a single room, like a single dorm room. And then we also have a different space where we have a shelter for 10 families. And when I got the opportunity to work there, um, they asked me if I wanted to be the administrative assistant and I just took the opportunity like whatever they wanted I would have been like the maintenance person I would have, I would have like answered the phones volunteer based I would have done I, I, anything I just wanted to work in homelessness I wanted to do that type of impact work because of what I learned through Elizabeth Richards and Kelly Hobbs at the Chandler Center I just I I wouldn't have understood the the dire need if I hadn't had those types of mentors in my life. And now I can't stop. I wake up every morning and I get to do, I get to fundraise to help support women who have been through extreme traumas in their lives. And I, I, I couldn't ask for a better job really. Um, but uh, it's, it's just been a, a huge blessing, but um, there's so much work to be done and there's so much work to, that the homeless population needs that, um, it's great to be here so you all can learn and we can all work as a community to help this issue. Amazing. And it's amazing, like you mentioned, that you you took the initiative to also get involved in at SNU, you know, with the Chandler Center and we we love them. We love those ladies are fantastic. And so that you're continuing to take that with you and, and sort of where I mean the, the resources that you just mentioned for you know the shelter and, and women and, and families, like that that's incredible work and and that's you know that's largely in, in part to like the the passion that you're bringing to you know so that's incredible so thank you so much for sharing so um let's see so um becca did you want to check out check off the next question that sounds great thank you um we have a lot of people i think tonight who signed up because this is an area that they're interested in but don't necessarily know where to start 
So what do you each think is the most important thing for people looking to help with homelessness or shelter? Um, what would you want them to know? And why do you think it's important? Doug, can I start with you on this one? Yeah, sure. Um, I guess it, I guess it depends on, uh, you know, where you live, what type of population you want to, you know, want to work with. Um, I, I guess I'll, I'll talk about youth. I mean, it's something that I'm really passionate about. So I would say that um, the easiest thing that you can do, um, no matter where you are in the country, is you can call up your local school district and ask to talk to your local homeless student liaison. Every, every school district is mandated to have one. Um, and they're, they're, going, they're going to be the ones who know exactly what's happening in their communities. So um, they tend to be, uh, you know, they're, they need help. I, I'll say that. So every, every homeless student liaison is always going to be in need of, you know, of, of something for a student. So if, if you want to, if you want to, you know, help out somebody, that's going to be a real simple, you know, way to go about doing that just to get connected. Thank you. Uh, Matt, can I pick on you next? Sure, sure. So one of the things that I know I've learned and through the work that I've been doing would be uh, what your needs and desires are may not be their needs and desires. So during the pandemic, um, actually close to my house, I live a mile from where I work and on the route, uh, there are some of the social services agencies. And so during the pandemic, those men and women uh, who were homeless really just came out of where they were to all be in one area. So they was called Tent City, uh, you know, several, several blocks so much so that uh, they actually about two or three weeks ago, uh, the county or the city mandated them to leave uh, and they were, they were provided hotels because of infestation of rats. Uh, and I know it's kind of gross and I share that because that goes back to the, what your needs are and desires are, may not be their needs and desires. Um, one of the things that we saw throughout this time in the pandemic, um, was that people in, had good intentions, right? To bring items to these men and women. So again, what a lot of people do is they perceive and they project what they think they would need in the situation to what the other people need. And so people might need tons of food, pallets of food. They might need tons of clothes. They might need X, Y, and Z, all this equipment. But when it comes down to it, it's just getting piled and piled and piled and sat around and this food is sitting there and getting moldy that's going to bring rodents around. So this tent city isn't the case in every scenario, but um, when you think of wanting to help men and women and children experiencing poverty and homelessness, maybe ask first, talk to the local agencies to find out what they really need. Um, because again, we, we assume a lot. And so that would be my, my pitch is just to ask questions, learn a little bit and talk to agencies doing the work before just jumping in. Um, yeah, that'd be my answer. Thank you. I, I think that honesty is really important to hear because I think you're right. People think they're helping, but I've heard before how it can create more work for people to sort through things that just aren't needed instead of taking the intentional time to ask the questions and to do the work that they're looking for. Um, Whitney, want to answer that one next? Uh, the question was, what, let me pull it up again. What do you think is the most important thing for people looking to help with homelessness uh, to know and why? Yeah, uh, I wish I could teach like a college course on this um, because it's actually a topic we talk about a lot at the YWCA and um, I'll, I'll really, it's similar to most of everybody's answers. It's ask ask what we need. Um, we have, especially at the YWCA, we have limited storage. So a lot of people um, want to drop off clothing. They want to drop off all these different um, items, but we have small storage spaces. And, you know, I, I may have like a bunch of clothes that fit me, but we may not have a person in our shelter that will fit those clothing for a year. And that sits there. Um, a lot of nonprofits really, we, we just need the question, how can I help? How can I support you? 
um, because each each nonprofit has different issues. Some nonprofits may have like an extreme amount of detergent, like as an example, but another nonprofit could have like a ton of personal hygiene products. And so it, it really varies depending on what we need. Um, during COVID, we had so many people reach out and say, how can I help? What, what types of issues do you need? or uh, things you need. And we had people dropping off gift cards. We had uh, people asking our grocery lists for clients, things like that. That's, that's really how the impact starts. It's understanding what the community needs, what that organization needs rather than what you think they need. Because causing that extra work could take an hour of somebody's time, but that's an hour somebody could have been spending, you know, advocating on an issue or meeting a new donor or um, supporting a client's needs or bringing resources to a family. Um, and it's, it's simple. It's a quick email or a quick call. And I really think that's, that's, that's how you make that impact. That's that quick connection and really listening. I love the way you put that of someone's time could be used in a different way. Um, it's a great thing for us all to consider of how much am I helping? What's my impact? Maria, do you have anything to add to that question? I'll just, um, first of all, I'll say ditto for everyone here, um, because I think everyone has made real important comments for people to know um, how to work with uh, local agencies, how not to help, or what isn't really helpful. Matt really hit on that extremely well. I think what's, uh, just two other points, you know, um, oftentimes people see what they think is homelessness because it is somebody who may have a mental health issue or they have a substance use disorder. Um, and that's what you're seeing in your community and people become afraid. And um, I think to Matt's point and to Doug's point is to really just be educated, like Whitney said to, you know, just learn a little bit about the community by asking the agencies who are doing the work and find out what they can do. You know, how can you approach somebody who may be having a challenge, uh, who may be outside your business, for example. There's ways that these agencies can help you, help your customers, and again, help your community. But I, I just want to add that, um, it's extremely important to know that homelessness is, is a housing issue. Um, you know, if we had more affordable, low income housing, um, we would be able to house everyone who you noted at the very beginning across the United States. And that means each one of us has to look at our own communities and decide that yes, low income housing belongs here. Um, it's that famous, not in my backyard. Um, we see it all the time. Um, we see it in New Hampshire. We see it in Seattle. We see it in Washington, DC. Um, if we don't have communities that can say yes to helping those people in need, then we are always, always, always going to have a homelessness problem. So I think it's just important for us to understand that and work with our communities in the best way possible. Thank you. Um, all these were such important points and I hope everyone listening uh, has something that they can take away now um, to figure out how they can start getting involved and where the best use of their time is. So I'm gonna pass it back to Chantel. Fabulous, thank you so much. So um, thank you for, you know, for all of those pieces. And I think one of the things that I heard from, from all of you and, and Maria, I think you drove it home there was, you know, thinking about education and thinking about, you know, the resources to like really, you know, either reach out to the agencies, reach out to, you know, the homeless student liaisons in your community and, and really think about what the community needs. Right. So I know we have listener or kind of people coming in from all different places. So are there any, and this can be national organizations or, or websites, are there any go-to resources that you would recommend for those that are looking to get educated and um, for them to just kind of be well-informed on the issues that are related to housing and homelessness? Um, and Whitney, would you like to, to kick us off? Yes, this is actually one of my favorite questions. Um, there are so many ways to get involved. Um, look up the shelters in your area um, and see the needs they have. But more importantly, um, I just want to like, like shout what Marie said from the, Maria said from the rooftops, like get involved in local 
government, get involved in local politics, see what, what's at the table. Um, working in Cambridge, we had the affordable housing overlay, um, which was a conversation for over a year and a half. And it was the conversation of not in my backyard. And those are the types of things that we need people at the table shouting from the rooftops that we need affordable housing because we, we can't, we can scream all we want, but we need like people in the community saying, I need affordable housing for my neighbor. I need support for my neighbors. Um, and that's really where you get involved. It's get involved, learn, go to your town meetings, see what the town council or the city council is talking about, see what your mayor is doing or um, local governments doing about affordable housing. But more importantly, check in with the shelters in your area, see how you can support them. Do a Facebook birthday fundraiser. I, I can't tell you, like, if there's like a there's like a pile of people behind me every time we have a Facebook fundraiser that is dedicated to us where we're all smiling. Like I'll sit in like a our like our like weekly meeting and we're all like shouting about like a small fundraiser somebody's doing for us because that's money we did not have before to support housing. Um, so yeah, get involved in what's going on locally, uh, fight for affordable housing and get involved in your local shelter, see how you can support them. I, I've done little, like a sock drive for, you know, Boston homeless and I made an Amazon wish list and it took me like a half an hour to put together. Um, those types of things, they're, they're immeasurable to organizations. And if anybody ha needs support or has ideas and they want to run it by us, like I'm so happy to help with those types of things. So. Thank you so much. And thank you for offering your support as well. <laughs> I appreciate it. Um, Doug, would you like to take this one next? Sure. I mean, uh, one of one of my favorite groups is uh, it's called Schoolhouse Connection. It's a uh, it's an advocacy group um, that works with local liaisons and school districts, and they, uh, they do a lot of lobbying in Washington around legislation around uh, youth homelessness laws. Um, so they're they're a great organization to go check out. Um, if you're just around the country, there's some different types of models of housing options for young people. Uh, Ryan's House uh, for Homeless Youth on Wibley Island in Washington State um, is an amazing program. It started with uh, this lady just driving around in a truck, providing uh, you know providing supports to young people in her community to turning into a transitional living program to having a drop-in center and now to having you know all these great supports for for young people on on the island uh, in washington state um there's covenant house which is a national another national organization actually i believe they're an international organization uh i'm from philadelphia there's a covenant house if you're in the philadelphia area in germantown um so if you're in the philadelphia area go check them out um and then uh Avenues, which is a host home program in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Um, I personally love the host home model, especially in a state like New Hampshire, um, because we, you know, it doesn't take much in order to, you know, create housing opportunities. We, you don't need to build any brick and mortars. So let's say, you know, I have an extra room in my house. I'm an empty nester. Um, I'm willing to go through some really rigorous training to make sure that I understand full well like what I'm getting myself and my family into. And uh, if I'm matched with a young person, if the young person thinks that you know we we're a good fit for for them and their lifestyle, you know it could, be, it could turn into a really positive thing being able to provide a safe, stable, you know, living situation for a young person. Thank you so much. And yeah, I mean, that that's the ultimate, right, is is it like you mentioned, going through the training and making sure you're fully, you know, that you're full match and that you're all, you know, in sort of the same stage of understanding of what that will look like, but opening your home. I mean, that that's the, I feel like a really big way <laughs> that you could definitely impact um, for sure. So, um, Maria, would you like to take that one next? Sure, just a just a couple, um, and I was trying to find one. Uh, there's this guy called Ryan. His name is Ryan Dowd, and he um, does a lot of um, kind of podcasts. And he just has been uh, working in the hopelessness field for a very very long time, and he provides a lot of information. But really, his key message is all about empathy. 
and what empathy means. Um, and so if I can find it, I'll type it in or send it to somebody later. Um, there's another great group called Invisible People, um, and they do spotlights on uh, people who are uh, experiencing homelessness, and um, they provide a lot of great education about, um, again, what homelessness is and what homelessness is not. Um, and again, really bringing forth um, the humanity of homelessness um, because it's it's the people, right? It's not um, just all the other stuff that goes along with it. We're really at the bottom line. We're talking about people. Um, and then, of course, there's a national alliance to end homelessness. I mean, so that can um, provide information about where you can get more information about who is in your area, who is um, working in this field. They have lots of videos and you know, lots of lots of things that you can access. And uh, if I can find out more about Ryan Dowd, I will I'll put it in the chat. Perfect. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you so much for those resources. It was so incredible. And Matt, would you like to chime in? Sure. It's just, you know, kind of going a little bit of a different route is, you know, I think of my experience uh, and my experience isn't everyone's experience, but I don't know if I hadn't have had those years of volunteering with street soccer, if I would have wanted to take the job at Running Works. I might have wanted to volunteer, but taking a job is a different story. And I know the question uh, that was posed was, what would a grad or a recent grad you know, do if they wanted to get a job in, in an organization that dealt with poverty? I think if you haven't directly experienced it, I think you need to find an organization and it can be housing related, but it can also be you know, we have uh, some food trucks down here in Charlotte, rice and beans, uh, three nights a week. They provide a meal to men and women experiencing homelessness. Maybe volunteer with an organization like that. It, uh, there are several types of, of organizations that I think revolve around and um, help to combat poverty and homelessness and understanding what you're getting into because you need to have a heart for this. Um, it comes out quick with the clients that know what you're in it for. Are you in it for a paycheck, which nonprofit world does not really exist, but, uh, you know, you have, to, you have to know what you're getting into. And, and I think it, that's an honest statement that needs to be had. Um, I wouldn't try to get into, uh, be a chef at a restaurant cause I can't cook really, really well. Right. I know that about myself. So same thing with, you need to know what you're getting into and if you can mesh with that. So, uh, that's how I would approach that, that question. Such important advice. And as you mentioned, you know, this, this is, this is heavy work and it's, it's heavy on people's lives. So it's definitely something to, you know, consider. So thank you all for sharing those resources. And if there are any more, you know, definitely we can share them in the chat for our, our folks that are, are joining in today too. So, and I'll kick it over to Becca for our next question. Awesome. I also will be sending out a follow-up email after this session as well. And if you guys are comfortable sharing some of those links, and resources that you mentioned, that would probably be a great space uh, for us to send some of them out too. So I'll be in touch about that after. Um, I think we'll ask one more question from Chantal and I, and then check the Q&A. Um, and we got some questions that were submitted when people signed up as well. So um, we know that COVID-19 and the pandemic has impacted a lot of people, um, a lot of organizations. If you don't mind sharing a bit about how the pandemic has impacted your organization, what it has changed or taught your organization or you personally, um, that would be great. Um, I, for, I don't want to like choose the same person each time. I'm so sorry, um, but I'm going to go with Matt. You're in the middle for me. Here we are. Okay. Uh, perfect. I can do this one. All right. So, I mean, yes. I think like many small nonprofits, large nonprofits, businesses, individuals, the pandemic impacted us. For us specifically at Running Works, um, a couple main main points I would give. One is on a on a program side, we are an in person relational program. Twenty five thirty races, like I said, a year. We do a program every Tuesday, every Friday, where we go out for a walk or a run, and then we do a life skill, a 45-minute workshop on time management, goal setting, nutrition, vulnerability, yoga, you name it, we talk about it. We couldn't do that anymore. And so for the first couple of weeks of March, we were thinking, well, what are we going to do? Our, our big connection point is relationships with our team members. So we went virtual. And so since March 26th of last year, we have done 
every Tuesday, every Friday, holidays included, a virtual life school on our Facebook Live private group. And, you know, it's interesting how you might think a homeless man, man or woman or, or child, um, they might not have the resources, they might have the internet, they might not have phones, they have smartphones, right? They can find internet. We have consistent participation. Um, our team members want, want engagement, they want connection, they're typing in questions, they're being vulnerable as we are talking and they're just texting things in. Um, and so that's been a huge change. We knew that there was a shift in the needs. So we started doing care packages once a month that we deliver. So we deliver care packages to their, their homes. Luckily, a good majority of our core team members, our core uh, clients, had housing, whether that was through our, our uh, supportive housing program, uh, an apartment that they had, a shelter, or a friend. So we were delivering care packages. Um, so that was a huge change. But then I think the other big shift, and I, I think the other panelists would agree, is fundraising and funding. You know, it threw us for a loop. We, have, we, we gain a, a large portion of our funding through our, our races that we go to, that we volunteer and we get a, a financial contribution. Those weren't happening. Our gala in person had to be moved several times, and then we went virtual, and then the location was flooded, and then we had to move it again. And so everything last year just came to a head. So uh, we've had to be, and I know pivot is the buzzword, right? But we had to pivot and change and, and be creative. And I think through all of it, we found that we can be creative and we can um, make it work. Our team members are still maintaining, you know, we wanted to focus on them and making sure that they were healthy and safe. And so, yeah, it's been a, it's been a journey, uh, but we're, we're making it through. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Whitney, can I toss it to you? Yeah, um, COVID-19 really changed the way we worked in terms of um, shelters, mostly because we, we operated in an emergency space for a, in a, a straight year, um, if I'm being honest. Um, everything was changing. Um, we actually spent all of Women's History Month really honoring the um, our people on the ground who literally, uh, once March hit, took every protocol that we dealt with and they made it, they they made it happen. If we had to change things up because of mask wearing, if we needed to distribute a ton of masks to our clients, if we needed to get food distributed, we knew that we had our people on the ground who were able to do that, but they, they were heroes during that time. Um, a lot of us, especially in administration, we worked from home um, and we, we relied on incredible individuals on the ground to continue providing services. Um, we, uh, I work in development. Um, fundraising changed, obviously, beyond words. Like, I I remember my first fundraising event on Zoom. There was like three of us, and I was like, I don't know how I'm going to do my job anymore. I don't know how to project fundraising numbers anymore. What what world are we living in? Um, but I, I have to say, like, I worked on with a team of individuals, a very small but mighty team, who we just supported each other. We, we had weekly staff meetings that weren't staff meetings. They were, we checked in on each other. How are you doing? Um, what, what are your challenges? How can I support you during this time? Um, but when it came to our clients, we all just had one collective goal and it was keep them safe and keep them without COVID. And I am really, really lucky that we have not had any outbreaks at both our, our large shelter and our family shelter. Um, it's changed the way we, the way we humanize um, homelessness. It's, we realized during this time that homeless, uh, I think the Cambridge community in general realized um, the way to keep the homeless safe during this time was to give them homes, give them housing. And we saw all these pop-up um, shelters being created. But my huge concern is what happens when COVID is over? What happens to all of those pop-up housing spaces that we created during that time? And we're, we're right back in the same space we were in the beginning where one, one major crisis and we have to worry about all of these individuals who don't have the one standard of living they deserve and that's housing. That's housing, food, like those major things that they need. And um, I think that's what we're trying to do with the YWCA right now is how do we advocate for that continuing? How do we, how do we keep fighting for housing um, post COVID. And um, those are the major things that I, I could go on for hours about how COVID impacted us, but I think it helped us really continue in this strong advoc advocacy space of every single person needs housing to be safe. And um, 
I think it's going to help the momentum of us pushing for that in the state of Massachusetts. Thank you. Uh, Maria? You would think everyone would know exactly where the mute button is. Um, so, uh, you know, um, like everyone else, right? So resiliency, pivot, uh, flexibility, um, we've had to be extremely flexible. I, you know, from my perspective, one of the biggest things that we had to do was communicate often and uh, it just constant, right? So constant communication to our staff, to our participants, to the people who live in all of our programs. Um, and unfortunately, we, we did have quite a few different outbreaks um, at our uh, various community living situation, uh, housing opportunities that we have for people. So um, we had to deal with that not only for our participants, but for our staff, which um, also meant sometimes our programs ran very bare bones, um, and that has been an extreme challenge. Um, I think you know, we've all learned a ton. I think what scared me the most was, um, you know, we run a couple of different shelters where people were living in fairly close quarters to each other. And when we had to be six feet apart, um, our part of our organization actually had to move people who were in our shelters almost back into homelessness. So we really had to look at new locations to put people up. We had to hire new people. We had to figure out how to feed everyone. Um, so again, talking about being nimble and flexible and calling on the community to help support all of these um, new needs that came up, I think taught us a lot about um, how to assess risks in the future um, and how to deal with crises and emergencies on a whole different level. So. I think we've learned a ton um, in this very, very trying time. And I think we're still learning. Um, vaccinations uh, for people who um, may be weary of vaccinations is a whole nother ball game. So I'm sure all, my, all these panelists are, are dealing with that. Trying to help our most vulnerable people um, get the vaccine and feel confident about the vaccine and coming back for a second shot. I mean, this is, this is a, a challenge that um, we're dealing with each and every day. So again, resiliency, being flexible, um, and just really working with our communities to help us uh, really make sure we're doing the best job that we can. Thank you. It's super interesting to hear all the different perspectives of all the people who have been impacted, um, including yourselves and your staff, and how much you were all responsible for in a pandemic that is stressful enough. Never mind, you're responsible for so many people. So thank you to all four of you for the work that you've been doing. Um, Doug, I'm take uh, take us home on this one. Yeah, sure. Um, and my my dog is trying to make a guest appearance, by the way. So he's 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 over here. And, uh, Something tells me people would love that. Dog, so. Um, well, before I get started, I just want to give like Maria a shout out because when she came on, like there, she had a huge mountain to climb with with all what she was coming into. Um, the Manchester Fire Department, Manchester Police, Manchester Public Health, the Mayor's Office, um, and Families in Transition, like their whole outreach team did an amazing job. Um, really taking care of the homeless population in Manchester. So I just want to just give a quick shout out to you know, what you guys are doing up in Manchester still, because that's not easy work. And I, I remember all the challenges that you guys are going through and uh, it's amazing what you guys have been able to do. Um, here in Nashua, and uh, all right, I'm just, just get up here. This is, this is Benson, he's got a scarf. So this is what Goldens do, they just want pets. Um, but anyway, here in Nashua, uh, what, we, what we noticed was that um, we, we just had to adapt to what we, what we normally do. Um, we were mostly seeing people in person before the pandemic and when the pandemic hit, we had to quickly come up with, um, a lot of paperwork that could be, you know, done over a computer. Um, unfortunately, not everyone has a computer, you know, so we had to make sure that, you know, even though we were trying to go virtual in, in many ways, we still had to you know, have, you know, paper copies for people who didn't have access to technology like that. So, and or make ourselves available to people who didn't have that technology so we could do 
the intakes over the phone with an individual. So, you know, we, we just didn't want to keep people away just because they didn't have access. Um, you know, we, we were able to get back as, as an agency because we're pretty small. We have our own separate little offices. So we were able to quickly get back. In. Really, dog? My, my dog is now very, very thirsty. So. And hopefully he's not, he's not done. Okay. But, um, perks of being a dog owner, right? Okay. Um, <laughs> so luckily we are, we're a small enough agency where we're able to get back into office fairly quick. And, uh, um, we were able to almost get back to business as usual. Um, but we, what we saw was, uh, we were able to receive some extra funds through some agents through some government agencies and uh, we were able to utilize those funds to get people rehoused we were able to kind of widen um, restrictions around how we could make people eligible for programs so for instance um, for our rapid rehousing program a family of two so a single mom let's say with one child uh, would have to be 30 percent of the annual median income level for our area which is for, for two people, about $30,000. But we were able to expand that to 50%, so that $30,000 limit went up to around like $40,000. So it made a ton more people eligible for services, so we were able to kind of get people um, who wouldn't really be able to access those services rehoused. So that was a really beautiful thing. So, you done? You done, Benson? Okay. Right. Perfect timing there. I think, <laughs> I think Benson really helped us on this panel, really sold how wonderful it was. Uh, but really, thank you to all of you for participating um, and being so helpful and sharing um, some formal pieces about yourselves and your work. Chantel, will you wrap it up for us? Perfect. And I just shared all of our contact information. And again, I shared what Becca just mentioned. Thank you so much to Whitney, Maria, Doug, Matt, for spending your nights with us and appreciate all of you for participating and, and joining us this evening and um, being, you know, hopefully you were able to get some nuggets to bring with you to, to really help in this space because it is heavy and there's a lot to a lot of work to be done as one of our panelists mentioned. So um, with that, I can't believe it, but it's already 32. So um, if you do um, have any questions or would like to contact our panelists, they have shared their contact information, which you see on your screen as well. Um, and thank you to Media Services for your support this evening evening. Again, thank you to our panelists. Thank you to Becca. Um, and you also will see on your screen um, the link to the next, well, to the Global Data Service overall website where you can see next month's information for um, service on environmental justice. So we'll have another panel, education sessions, lots of ways to get involved. And Becca will be popping in some links in our chat for our survey, as well as um, some of the, the information that you can get in touch with our, our panelists. So again, thank you so much, everyone, for spending your evening. Thank you to our panelists, and I hope that you all have a wonderful rest of your evenings.